Uh, pen names are pretty common in English literature. Uh, you've got Lewis Carroll, you've got Sapphire, you know, even J.K. Rowling's a bit of a pen name. Um, but if you walk away with just one thing from this lesson, please let it be the George Eliot is a pen name. I mean, that name sounds boring enough that you would probably assume it's real who would choose George Eliot as their fake name. Um, but that was probably the point of choosing it. Um, in fact, George Eliot's real name was actually Mary Ann Evans. She was a woman. Ooh, scandal. Um, really, at the time that Evans was writing, which was the second half of the 19th century, female authors weren't uncommon, but she wanted to make sure that her novels were really taken seriously and not sort of like instantly dismissed into that category of like light, tawdry romances that female writers were typically associated with. The word chiclet didn't exist then, but that's, I think, what she was trying to avoid. Um, she also wanted to uh, draw attention away from her not-so-standard personal life, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. So first thing to note, George Eliot, not her real name. George Eliot, actually a woman. Um, so we're going to start by talking about the life of Mary Ann Evans before the writer George Eliot even existed. Um, she was born in a rural English family in 1819 um, because many didn't consider her conventionally attractive. Uh, she was more or less deemed unmarriageable, which seems harsh. Um, therefore, her father decided to invest a more than average amount of money into her education, um, which is sort of like the ultimate backhanded compliment. Um, this extra schooling went hand in hand with her already considerable intelligence and voracious appetite for reading. It's probably something you might notice is a real similarity amongst a lot of the writers that we cover in these videos, is that they grew up loving to read and, and loving stories, and Marianne Evans was, was no exception. Uh, at the age of 16, sadly, uh, her mother passed away, and she had to leave school and come home and act as her father's housekeeper. And uh, after this point, her education would mostly come through self-study. Uh, while she was helping out her father, Evans was exposed to things that would later really influence her writing, including um, the differences that she observed between the upper and lower classes, between uh, you know, urban and rural communities, and uh, the many differing religious opinions that exist everywhere. Uh, her father died when she was 30, and after, after his death, she spent a little time traveling and then moved to London to become the assistant editor of a, a left-wing journal called the Westminster Review. Uh, this provided her with an introduction to the world of professional writing, and it was in this position, in this position that she produced um, a lot of essays and works of criticism. Um, this move to London also brought on some changes in her personal life. Uh, they, they weren't too well accepted at the time. Um, in essence, uh, Evans entered a relationship with a philosopher and a critic named George Henry Lewes, and he was already married and already had children, so that was very much frowned upon. Um, he and his wife had agreed on an open relationship, so there really wasn't anything unethical going on per se, um, but proper Victorian society was pretty taken aback by, with the openness with which they carried on their, you know, this extramarital relationship. Uh, by the mid-1850s, Evans had built up uh, some steam in her writing career, and she was ready to take, take that leap into fame. And it was at this point that she adopted her pen name. Um, as we mentioned, the reasons for this were really twofold. She wanted to draw attention away from her fairly scandalous lifestyle. She wanted to be known as Marianne Evans, the woman who's carrying on a relationship with a married man. And also, she just didn't want to be thought of as just another female writer. Um, the inspiration for that second point is detailed in uh, her popular essay from 1856, which has come to be sort of like her, the statement of purpose of her writing career, and it's called Silly Novels by Lady Novelists, and it's, I recommend checking it out. Um, so George Eliot, now we're going to talk about George Eliot the writer using the pen name. Um, first published work of fiction was a three-part series of a ser serialized short stories entitled Scenes of a Clerical Life. A year after this, 1859, um, her auspicious output of novels began. Uh, Eliot crafted seven full-length books, and uh, though we're not going to talk about all of them here, we're going to hit three of the big ones. But first, as we look at some of Eliot's most important works, uh, let's keep in mind some of the major themes that she's dealing with in them. Any study of her work isn't complete without mentioning the following themes that almost all of the novels seem to tackle in some way. Uh, the first of which is realism, or it's basically you know, an attempt to write things as they are. Um, as you might have guessed so far, uh, Eliot was a pretty no-nonsense woman. She didn't want to be considered a silly novelist, so it was important to her that her work be real. And she wanted to, you know, capture what she saw as real people with real problems. Fantasy didn't hold an appeal for her. Um, this goes really hand-in-hand hand with her next trait, which was um, a real emphasis on rural life. 
Um, she had a rural upbringing and, and really was starting to pay attention to those differences between the, the rural and the urban lifestyles. And this, you really see this in her writing. Many of her novels are focused on realistic characters in small towns who really kind of lead more mundane lifestyles. It's not kings and queens or knights and fairies. It's, it's just regular people. Um, and Elliot thought it was important to focus on this because rural people were considered more common, more average, and uh, thus you know, closer to pure human nature. In other words, you know, in Eliot's perspective, the, the rural way of life and their opinions and their, and their struggles were just more real than, than the people in the cities who maybe had you know, a, a different sort of lifestyle that didn't have those same aspects. Um, so you can see those two really complement each other nicely, her interest in realism and her interest in, in the rural life. Um, so let's, let's talk about a few of her books. Um, her first novel came in 1859, and it was called Adam Bede, and as you may have guessed, uh, the novel has a rural setting. It's a, the fictional town of Hayslope. Uh, this focused on what we would probably think of as like a love rectangle of four characters whose emotions are all tangled up. I mean, unrequited love. It's tough, right? We've all been there. Um, describing the plot in more detail would take more time than I have, so I'm just going to talk about why the novel's important and why people still love it today. Um, it was, it was incredibly popular at the time and kind of like built interest and excitement around this mysterious George Eliot. Uh, it was said that Queen Victoria liked it so much that she commissioned an artist to paint scenes out of the novel for her. It's cool to be queen. Um, second, right out of the gate, um, Eliot's mission was really clear. As uh, the f a fellow Victorian mainstay, Charles Dickens, wrote of the novel, uh, the whole country life that the story is set in is so real and so droll and genuine and yet so selected and polished by art that I cannot praise it enough to you. And this is really what George Eliot was going for. And you know, if really, at the time, if Charles Dickens like your, likes your book, you probably feel pretty good about what you're doing, because it's, it's a good praise to get. Um, another immensely popular work of Eliot's, uh, probably, I would say, number two of all time Eliot works, is uh, Silas Marner from 1861. Um, this novel not only revisits Eliot's preoccupation with rural realism, but um, Rural realism, that's a rough one, uh, but also questions traditional religious structures in some pretty potent ways, and I think pretty ballsy of her considering the time period. Um, here, uh, Silas Marner is a weaver in a small urban Calvinist congregation, and he's exiled to the country after being falsely accused of stealing money from his deacon. So he's in this new rural setting after living in a more urban area, which really ties into Eliot's wanting to compare the lives of the rural to the urban people. And uh, he becomes a recluse once he's in this rural setting um, until he happens upon an abandoned child and decides to raise her as his own, which who doesn't love a good orphan story? Annie, Harry Potter, every, everyone loves an orphan story. Um, Marner's ability to create happiness for himself in this environment, free from the city life, free of the church, is really sort of an act of cultural rebellion. He's sort of saying he doesn't need the things society tells him he needs to be happy. Um, Silas Marner remained a really major force in pop culture since its publication. It's had numerous adaptations, and uh, he's been uh, portrayed by actors like Ben Kingsley and Steve Martin and even Samuel L. Jackson. Um, they've been played with uh, various degrees of faithfulness, as you might imagine. Um, finally, we're going to touch on my personal favorite George Eliot novel, and, and maybe one of my favorite books of all time, and that's Middlemarch, or its full title is Middlemarch, A Study of Provincial Life. Um, you can see that this book's rural focus is uh, right there in the title, Study of Provincial Life. Um, it takes place in another fictionalized uh, pastoral town. And this novel is, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's huge. It's eight books long, and depending on which version you get, can be like about a thousand pages. Um, it really like follows the lives of a pretty significant cast of characters who try to make their way through life's various troubles in the face of both the social issues of the day, and then more sort of like personal moral compromises that they need to make with themselves. Middlemarch is generally considered to be uh, one of the best books of the English language, and I, I fully support that. Um, it's full of really compelling characters and complex situations, and some ethical ambiguity, which you didn't always see um, in, more in books. Like, for example, in Dickens, there's a, a real sort of moral sense of right and wrong. You know who's good and you know who's bad. But in Eliot, it's different. There's, there's a real complexity there, and it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, we've actually got a whole lesson on Middlemarch, so I recommend you check it out and, and then go and read it, of course. Um, but for now, it's just good that you know that it's, it's George Eliot's work, and it's probably uh, her most popular. And it's, it's kind of the apex of realism in a rural setting, and that's, 
that's a big you know, mark of a George Eliot work. Um, besides those aforementioned essays and novels, uh, Eliot was actually also an accomplished poet, because apparently no one during that time could just be one thing. Um, she was also a translator, but it's really those novels that people remember her for, and I think Middlemarch in particular. Um, and additionally, I think Silas Marner, though I don't like it quite as much, they're really sort of like stone-cold classics of the English language, and they're still studied and enjoyed today. And uh, I think one key thing to remember is that she really loved to set her work in the rural setting, and uh, she attempted to fuse everything that she did with, with realism so she could tackle the serious subjects that were facing the people of her time and uh, attempt to present people as they really lived, an accurate portrait of people in her time. It's, it's a lofty goal, for sure. And um, you know maybe not everyone thinks that she succeeded, but I think she did. Um, and finally, if there's one thing you're going to remember, it's that George Eliot was a pen name and that she's actually a woman. So uh, that's, that's the scoop on George Eliot, a.k.a. Marianne Evans.